This 37-year-old female presented with a lateral incisor which had to be extracted. The clinical situation represents an advanced difficulty level according to the SAC classification of the ITI. The periapical radiograph shows the external root resorption of the lateral incisor. The extension of the root resorption is clearly visible in the CBCT. The coronal cut shows the bone lesion distally to the root and a sufficient crest width of more than 7 mm. The extraction is initiated with an intracellular incision using a microblade. The gingival margin is carefully mobilized with a fine periosteal elevator. The extraction is carefully done with a rotational movement. The socket is debrided to remove the granulation tissue. Then a collagen plug is applied for the stabilization of the coagulum. The socket is left to heal by secondary granulation. The removed tooth shows the area with the external resorption. During the eight weeks of socket healing, keratinized mucosa spontaneously forms over the socket. Initially, there is a slight invagination of the mucosa at the crest. Then a gradual flattening is observed on the mid-facial aspect of the extraction socket. However, the ridge contour does not change at the adjacent teeth within a four to eight week healing period. This frontal view shows the resorption of the thin facial wall triggered by bundle bone resorption. This causes a crater-like defect in the middle of the socket. The sagittal view shows the facial bone resorption and the ingrowth of soft tissues into the alveolus, leading to a spontaneous thickening of the soft tissues. This is biologically driven and is a clear clinical advantage for the future implant surgery. The coronal view shows the resorption of the facial bone wall and the spontaneous soft tissue thickening. Simultaneously, a flattening of the soft tissue contour takes place in the middle of the socket. Eight weeks post-extraction, implant surgery is initiated with a sulcular incision at the adjacent central incisor and extended in the edentulous area in a slightly palatal position. The blade is inserted deep into the remaining socket along the inner palatal wall. The incision is continued through the sulcus of the adjacent lateral incisor, combined with a papilla base incision and a vertical releasing incision at the first premolar. The result is a triangular flap which offers excellent vascularity and eliminates the risk of a vertical scar within the aesthetic frame. The mucoperiosteal flap is now carefully elevated with a fine tissue elevator. In the extraction site, the soft tissue within the former extraction socket is mobilized as part of the buccal flap. This provides a thick soft tissue biotype in the future implant site. The surgical site is exposed and irrigated with sterile saline. The palatal flap is elevated as well to expose the palatal wall of the bone defect. A retraction suture is now applied to keep the flap off the surgical site during implant surgery. For the next step, blood is harvested with a syringe and stored in a sterile dish. Now autogenous bone chips are locally harvested within the same flap from the cortical bone surface. This can be done with a flat chisel at the nasal spine or with a sharp bone scraper from the bone surface towards the nasal fossa. The resulting bone chips are 1.5 to 2 mm in size and they are stored in the blood. As shown by several preclinical in vitro studies, these bone grafts release numerous proteins and growth factors into the blood and is termed bone conditioned medium.
The surgery continues with the examination of the local anatomy by using first a periodontal probe. The crest width is then analyzed with a caliper, which should measure at least 6 mm orofacially. Implant bed preparation is initiated with a number 2 round burr preparing into the apical bone structure. This is followed by the first spiral drill of 2.2 mm diameter, using a drill speed of 800 rpm. Bone preparation is done with copious cooling using chilled sterile saline. The depth gauge is inserted to check the sink depth and the implant axis. It's obvious that the axis must be carefully corrected to a slightly more inclined axis. This is done with the second spiral drill using a reduced drilling speed of 500 rpm. The preparation depth is chosen at 14 mm. The second depth gauge now confirms a correct implant axis. The final preparation is done with a profile drill, removing some bone at the inner surface of the palatal bone wall. The implant is inserted with a speed of 15 rpm without irrigation. The implant shoulder should always be located subcrestally in relation to the palatal wall. Depending on the local anatomy, a healing cap of 2 mm is inserted. The frontal view shows the correct positioning coronal apical direction, having the implant shoulder roughly 3 mm apical to the mucosal margin of the future implant crown. The occlusal view shows that the implant shoulder is positioned about 1 mm towards the palate. The exposed implant shoulder is inside the bone, resulting in a two-wall defect on the facial aspect. At the next step, an incision of the periosteum is done to mobilize the flap for tension-free wound closure. Small boreholes are applied in the cortical bone surface to open the marrow cavity and allow some bleeding on the facial aspect. The blood in the sterile dish is diluted with some sterile saline to increase the volume of the bone-conditioned medium. The medium is used to moisten the bovine bone filler, which has a low substitution rate. The bone condition medium contains a lot of proteins and growth factors, which are absorbed by the bone filler particles. Bone augmentation is initiated with the application of the autologous bone chips. The first layer of bone chips is applied to the rim of the healing cap and completely fills the facial bone defect. The second layer of bovine bone particles is used to over-contour the local ridge anatomy. The surgical technique is called contour augmentation, using the two synergistic bone fillers of autologous bone chips and bovine bone particles. A critical step for a GBR procedure is the utilization of a barrier membrane. A collagen membrane is cut into two pieces, a larger and a smaller one, and trimmed to shape. Collagen membranes offer several advantages for the clinician. One is that they are easy to apply when soaked with blood. When moistened with bone conditioned medium, the membrane becomes soft and adhesive. It can be easily adapted to the local bone anatomy. The second membrane strip improves the membrane thickness in the defect area and improves the stability of the membrane. The sagittal and coronal views show the various steps of contour augmentation. The bone chips fill the bone defect and will stimulate new bone formation. The bovine bone particles provide the contour augmentation and long-term stability, since they have a low substitution rate. The collagen membrane provides a barrier function to avoid the ingrowth of soft tissue cells. The surgery is completed with a tension-free primary wound closure using interrupted single sutures with 5-0 non-resorbable monofilament suture material. Several sutures are applied to achieve a close adaptation of the wound margins. This is followed by insertion of the provisional prosthesis 
which has been shortened in the edentulous area to avoid direct tissue contact. A pressure dressing is applied to the upper lip to minimize the post-surgical swelling in the first two days of healing. Eight weeks later, a reopening procedure is done with a punch incision using a 12B blade. The healing cap is removed with a screwdriver and replaced by a longer one. Following a few days of soft tissue healing, the provisional crown is inserted to initiate the soft tissue conditioning. The sagittal view shows the seating of the provisional crown. The facial bone wall is fully regenerated. The implant shoulder is located subcrestally, not only on the palatal, but also on the buccal aspect. The treatment is completed with the final all ceramic crown, which is screw retained to provide optimal precision between the implant and the crown interface.